All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Uh, welcome to this special video version of the ACFCS Financial Crime Cast, where we talk to many of the brightest minds in the financial crime and compliance field to discuss the news, views, and trends relevant to professionals today. My name is Brian Monroe, VP of Content at ACFCS. I'll be your host for today's festivities. As we're all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit the world hard, with more than 200 countries and territories around the world reporting a total of nearly 3.4 million confirmed cases of the coronavirus. The pandemic has taken lives and life savings and slowed the global economy as many sectors have shut down or instituted work from home protocols as individuals shelter in place. Not surprisingly, this has created compliance challenges and opened the door for criminal money laundering, fraud and phishing and other scam fusilades. For AML and other compliance teams, they have been tasked to do more with less while at home, with some teams scattered or trimmed as financial institutions lay off workers as overall transactional throughput falls. That's why I'm excited to talk to today's guest, David McLaughlin, about how banks are responding in some cases through buttressing the loss of human capital through technology to analyze compliance in a time of coronavirus. David is the Chief Executive Officer of Quantiverse, an artificial intelligence infused compliance technology firm. Well, David, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for being with uh, us today. But okay, one thing I've got to ask you, okay, I was looking up your background and I'm like, wait a minute, is this David McLaughlin or Tom Cruise? What is going on with that? <laughs> no, I, I uh, appreciate you saying that. Yes, I had the opportunity to serve uh, in the Navy for about eight years right after college. Wow. I uh, flew, went from uh, school down to flight school in Florida, and then uh, was stationed in Virginia Beach for most of the rest of my time in the Navy. It was a wonderful experience. I was grateful to do it and uh, really enjoyed my time. So Top Gun, huh? so does that mean you're in the Tom Cruise movie? <laughs> No, they have you seen my face? They wow, like, I'm saying, where is it? It's supposed to be there. Come on. So uh, one thing I wanted to talk, touch on today is kind of the trends you're seeing in terms of how financial crime and the coronavirus have converged. So uh, let's talk a little about it. What have you seen that have changed that is kind of relevant and germane to what financial crime compliance professionals might see in, say, a transaction monitoring system? Yeah, sure. So since uh, COVID, there's certainly been a uh, ramp up in uh, money laundering relative to fraud. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I think you most all of the periodicals and and uh, briefings out there will talk about how fraud is picked up due to COVID-19 and different kinds of fraud. Um, you know, certainly uh, um, expanded elderly fraud, um, uh, crony charity fraud. Um, all sorts of account takeover, all sorts of types of fraud have ramped up since COVID-19. And we've seen also a, an increase in the AML related to fraud. Um, so, yeah, those are the kind of things that we wow. have seen. But, you know, uh, with traditional sort of thoughts about AML, I'll share just a couple of uh, facts with you. You know, uh, while we've seen that uh, increase in that fraud. We've also seen some increases in what looks appears to be bribery. Uh, there are certainly some increases in what appears to be uh, sanctions violations with uh, money moving to individuals in areas that are sanctioned. But we've also seen a, a somewhat at the beginning of the crisis, you know, the first month of it, we've seen a, a decrease in the types of uh, financial crimes that uh, require people to get connected to each other, physically connected to each other, drug trafficking, human trafficking, those kinds of things. And they've been about the same volume of increases relative to decrease on a transaction basis. So uh, the number of alerted and suspicious activities, I'm sorry, number of suspicious activities hasn't necessarily gone up, but the alert volumes have increased relatively dramatically. Oh, wow. one, one organization uh, showed a 50% increase in, in alert volumes in about a month period. Uh, on average, it looks like about a 25 to 30% increase in alert volume. So while the, the types of financial crimes and investigations have changed, the number, the total number have, has increased relatively dramatically in the last two months. 
Well, and already, I mean, I know we've talked about this in the past, but just kind of overall managing those transactional alert volumes, trying to kind of the false positives from the things that are actually you're able to build a case upon, you know, that's already been kind of a long-standing challenge for fin crime professionals, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, that, that's, it has been the, the problem. I mean, one of the significant problems in the industry is, you know, before the crisis, it wasn't easy. Managing, uh, b- being able to satisfy the regulatory requirements on timing of managing alerts and submitting uh, SARS when appropriate has, um, you know, it's been a challenge. Um, compliance is, I think if you talk to compliance professionals, they will always tell you that it's an under-resourced function inside an organization. Even with the, the significant investments that have been made in it, it still feels under-resourced relative to the volumes. And so this has only made the problem harder. Now, I wanted to talk on kind of the context of, you know, why this issue plays into the overall problem of kind of uh, money laundering. But I was hoping you could just touch on, because maybe a lot of people are not familiar with, you know, artificial intelligence, transaction monitoring, kind of, you know, how these systems have been historically, you know, kind of rules-based or scenario-based or threshold-based. What is the difference of kind of between those systems and maybe um, a system that uses, you know, some of these buzzwords, artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation? Sure. So I think everybody's familiar with the rules-based uh, transaction monitoring system and the models that are uh, in place there. And they're, you know, they're, they're static rules that, that are uh, implemented, tested, and, and uh, validated to ensure that they find transactions or alert transactions that violate a rule. And they're all great. They're, you know, they're, they're wonderful technologies for doing that. And, and we believe that rules-based is an important part of a compliance program. We, we in no way recommend that people get rid of rules. Matter of fact, we use them in our technology for certain instances. Sometimes it's the right code, it's the right model for a certain type of crime. For, for instance, a, um, a type of uh, uh, finding a, a jurisdiction. You, you know, if, if a transactor is in a certain jurisdiction, that might violate a rule. And there's no reason to change from that rule. If, if I'm transacting with somebody in a high-risk jurisdiction, that's a wonderful u- uh, use of a rule to create an alert. Uh, the thresholding that you're talking about is establishing something that across the board might not be great for a rule. So for instance, some organizations have a limit on point of, search, uh, point of sale purchases. $1,500, $2,000, something above some threshold at a point of sale might create an alert. Well, that threshold might be appropriate for you and inappropriate for me. You know, uh, we don't necessarily spend the same amount of money in the right. same way. Context. Establishing that threshold works for some people, it doesn't work. Artificial intelligence machine learning uh, platforms are generally looking for anomalies a statistical based tool that will find things that are new, different, not codified in a rule, not written into a threshold, but just different. And we have uh, found and and proven time and again that you can find instances of risk by finding those statistical anomalies. A a great example of that, but certainly not limited to it, is lines of business doing transacting with each other. Mm -hmm. the, The system will find instances of certain types of business transacting with each other that's never seen before. Now, early on a system's life cycle, maybe it's just not seen it before, but it's a perfectly reasonable set of companies doing business with each other. But now we're at the point where we have essentially, our platform has essentially seen every type of line of business transacting with every other type of line of business. Right. And when it finds something that is new, that is an, that is an anomaly, chances are something suspicious is going on and it's a way to find things that that um, um, a rules-based engine won't necessarily find. No, and, and I, I love that kind of description because it's the classic dilemma of, of transaction monitoring systems. Do you set kind of a ton of alerts and a ton of thresholds and just kind of let them have at it and right. whatever pops up, pops up, you know, and again, there's that issue of the false positives. Or do you get something more specific, like you know, the the I've uncovered the transactional day, um, you know, 
transactional DNA of this terror group, and it involves you know, this country and this type of business, used cars and these kind of amounts, and then you put that over the transactions and you get more specific, better alerts, because you're looking for these, again, more specifics. So That's right. And also the criminals are changing so quickly. Correct. And, and that's a, a, a challenge with any type of rules-based engine is when changes, when the criminals learn about how they can get away with things or when they learn what they can't get away with exactly. anymore, they're very quick at adapting. And so it's hard, it's hard to keep up with that changing behavior in a, in a traditional and I guess, I mean, would you say that that's one of the reasons, and again, there's a lot of, cr criminals are very crafty here, but I mean, we face as a compliance community, uh, and again, you know, we're talking about compliance professionals, regulators, investigators, auditors, we face a pretty Herculean task because right now of the trillions of dollars laundered every year, we only seize and freeze supposedly less than a percentage point. So there's two ways to look at this. As this one person said at a congressional hearing, we're a decimal point away from complete failure. So none of us matter at all. No, don't, I don't look at it that way. Glass half full, there's obviously a lot of ways we can improve. And it seems like, you know, companies tinkering tech with technology can do that. Certainly. I mean, that's, that's exactly why we started Quantiverse. And, and I would say other firms like Quantiverse that have started in the last few years would probably say the exact same thing is, is that this is an age-old problem, and we think we can have a significant impact in that age-old problem of criminals getting proceeds from their illegal activities and then using those proceeds to enrich their own lifestyle or invest in further crime. That's a, that's a problem that we, we believe and we have shown that we can apply this technology to to, to help um, you know, change, change that paradigm and make it a little harder and a little riskier for the criminals to move that money around. Now, I have my list of formal questions here, but you know, there, there's another reason why, again, this discussion between me and you sharing your incredible knowledge, and again, you know, this is knowledge that few people have to know, criminal trends, systems, overarching compliance kind of rules and platforms, how they all mesh together. Um, I'm curious about you know, the kind of gaps that we also have to deal with, because again, you know, we have different ways, you know, sh information sharing, that's a big buzzword between banks, private, you know, uh, public firms, you know, and you have different uh, abilities for us to do that. You know, 314A that helps kind of law enforcement query banks broadly or even tell them about criminal trends. You have 314B that allows banks, gives them a safe harbor to share information on potential money laundering and really everyone believes, you know, the precursor crimes as well. But David, what we don't have is a 314C, where everybody gets right. together and says, here are the compliance practices that either, again, produce the best results, they're the most efficient to go after bad guys, or they pass muster with regulators. And it seems like to go after this massive money laundering problem, you have to have all the pieces of, of, of the puzzle, you know, the technology piece, the knowledge of you know, financial crime throughout the institution, and then also these kind of knowledge of, of these paradigms that are actually work, working to go after bad guys and please regulators. Yeah, I, and, and Brian, that's where I believe that ACFCS and organizations are adding a huge amount of value. And, oh, thank you. and hopefully we'll continue in spite of COVID to add a huge amount of value by pulling professionals together, regulatory professionals, law enforcement professionals, compliance professionals, technology professionals, pulling everybody together to to uh, engage in those conversations and, and be able to have some open dialogue about what is, what is going on. So I do think you know, your organization in particular is critical in that communication flow and the connection between those organizations. You know, there has been, there has been uh, a drive for public-private partnerships that are, have been very successful in the last several years, but I don't think it can, it can quite get to the point that you all and uh, your organization are, are helping uh, create that communi those communication channels. Oh, I, I thank you so much, David. I appreciate you saying that. So obviously, as you said, these alerts are rising and I've done several pieces on this and it's kind of the perfect storm against compliance professionals because you have them working from home, you have everybody panic buying, so these alerts are, are just absolutely soaring and you have teams that maybe they're, again, they're working from home, it's harder to communicate, and some banks, some you know, uh, whole sectors have fallen, so maybe they're laying people off. So right now, compliance officers 
you know, they're even under more pressure to be all things to all people. So I'm curious, how are banks kind of responding and where are you seeing them shift more resources and conversely, what areas are they pulling away? Yeah, if you, uh, if I refer to the previous slide that I showed is, is essentially what they're doing right now is just managing those alert volumes. I, I don't think they've had the opportunity, uh, you know, I'm not speaking for everybody, but from the conversations that I've had with uh, the heads of compliance departments, they haven't had the opportunity to, to think through exactly where they're going to apply their people in what areas and where they can lighten uh, up with the plan of people. They are, they are managing the alert volumes and they're managing those, those increased alert volumes in a really challenging environment of having to work their whole staff work from home, which has never happened before, and they never really, quite frankly, contemplated. So, so just getting through those alert volumes in a way that's not going to get their organizations in any sort of regulatory uh, hot water is, is what the conversations I've been having. Now, when I was chatting with you before, you had gave some fantastic advice, and it was really to lean on you know, what the regulators are saying, what investigators are saying to kind of pinpoint, uh, you know, where you can focus your resources. And in my coverage of this, you know, I wish they would have said more, but I have seen regulators say things like, you know, try to focus on certain frauds, certain COVID related frauds, um, try to not, again, you know, you have banks also now focused on kind of the, you know, PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. They're focused more on kind of doling out these stimulus funds to keep the economy afloat to help small businesses. But again, there's potential fraud in there as well. So it seems like, again, you know, the AML aspect of, of, of this is, is, you know, they're, they're putting it on the back burner a little bit because they're being forced to, you know, get this money out very quickly. Well, certainly the operational sides of the business are uh, um, doing the right things and, and getting PPP money and loan money uh, out that they need to do. But it is not. I mean, you read the the directives from the regulators, and I certainly don't mean to speak for the regulators, but you read the directives and it is not a, a um, uh, abdication. They're not allowing Correct. an abdication of their regulatory responsibilities. They have said, if you have a problem, call us and let's talk about it. Um, and we will be a little, give you a little leeway in the timing of filings, but they Absolutely have, correct. not that I've read, have ever said, we're not, gonna, we're not going to require you to fulfill your compliance duties. on your case. I'm sorry, David, I have to disagree with you. I specifically remember looking at that FinCEN piece and it said yeah. AML free pass was the yeah, one. Exactly, exactly, so, exactly. AML, we so, got a free pass, man. Doesn't matter. So we now. all know it's a mistake to think that it might be a free pass that we can just. So unfortunately, some organizations are, are I know, in conversations are having are accumulating this backlog that they know that they are going to have to work out correct out and oftentimes and um, you know they're a little challenged with how they're they're thinking through going and working off that backlog uh, you know it's going to accumulate they're not going to hire a, a new staff or a new army of investigators to come in and work the back work off the backlog so they really have two choices they can go try to hire consultants which are expensive and may have a a shortage of investigators themselves. Correct. They can look to technology and, and look to automation of technology and, and try to, to manage the backlog or prevent the backlog from happening through these technologies. So there's something that I chatted with you before uh, that, you know, I, I wanna, it's very germane to kind of what's happening now, even though, you know, there's a very compressed time frame for it to happen. But, you know, in December, 2018, there was a statement, and again, to me, this was an earth shattering statement by regulators, um, interagency statement that kind of exhorted, again, this wasn't guidance, this wasn't an order, this was just a statement that was kind of giving tacit acknowledgement and really um, opening the door for banks to tinker with technology. I, I called it an invitation to innovation. Um, and now again, you know, there's, even right now, there's places that, you know, they've outsourced compliance functions to India. Uh, maybe it's CDD, KYC, kind of the low hanging fruit of AML, but now they can't do that. So in a way, they might be looking to technology to again, bridge that gap between human capital that they can't rely on. So I wanted to ask you, are you seeing, or have you seen more companies kind of, you know, want to tinker 
with technology and then contextual point, even if they decide, look, we need to update our technology now because of the pandemic, that's not something that they can snap their fingers and in a couple of days the vendors produce, correct? Right, that's, that's certainly correct. So, you know, what has happened since the COVID, and, we, and I think we've all experienced this regardless of the industry and regardless of, of our functions inside that industry, is we've had to shift to a remote workforce. And, and that in itself is tinkering with the technology about how we take this workforce that was in place and now we make them productive out of place. How do we get them all access to VPN that you know is reliable? How do we make sure that they have the right laptops that they need to, to be able to handle PII? How do we get them connectivity that they need and make sure that our Zooms and our WebExes and those kind Absolutely. of things work? So that's been the, the bulk of the effort to date. And everybody's done a fairly you know, good job getting that in place and working but it hasn't changed the work. It's changed how we've done the existing work. And now what is going on is organizations are saying, okay, and now how do I fundamentally change the work that my people are doing? Uh, and can I fundamentally change the work that my people are doing? Because of this crisis has heightened our, our recognition of our, our reliance on a human capital uh, workforce that that may have blips in the future about its availability, whether it's because of IT uh, infrastructure or whatever. And so that's been the conversation that we have uh, been uh, excited to have with uh, organizations is how they change that. Let me uh, show you uh, a different slide. And um, this is a, a discussion of a fundamental shift in how work is happening. And again, you're, you're right, Brian, it can't be, uh, it's hard to take this technology and, um, you, you know, put it out the day, the next day that you decide that you need it. A little planning obviously has to take place, and I'll, t I'll talk about that planning in just a second. But what, what we have shown is that you can take mundane, uh, rote, repeatable tasks that humans are doing as part of the investigation process today research, invest, uh, uh, research, uh, finding uh, data, pulling in data, looking at adverse media, trying to find connections in that adverse media between certain parties. All the things that humans may not be great at because of the massive amounts of data that is available um, to go in and go look at. What humans are good at is the end of the process of once that data has been collected, is applying their judgment, their knowledge, their training, their expertise to see the shades of gray, to read between the lines, to really determine whether something is a risk to the organization or not. And so what we have been working on for years now and have rolled out and proven and validated with our customers is a way that you can automate those things that humans aren't necessarily the best at and give them the tools so that they can do what it is they're very good at. And that is financial crime, investigator and a determiner of whether something in fact is a risk or not a risk. Now to your earlier point, you can't just turn that thing on or, or previously you couldn't just turn that thing Off on. Off the shelf, press the button, good. that's it, right? And then we're done? But this is what we have done at Quantiverse since the COVID crisis. We have taken this alert investigator solution that we have clients that have um, consumed and, and put into production and we have put it into a business continuity planning environment. That's just so, what I was gonna ask you about. So essentially, we allow them to, to take this, we, we validate it, we calibrate it for them, we, we uh, test it with their transactions, and then we put it on the shelf for them. And, and while we all hope for the best around second and third waves of COVID, we need to plan for the worst mm -hmm. and prepare well for the worst. And in the event, God forbid, an organization is short of investigators relative to their alerts, they can snap their fingers and literally push a button and port their alerts over to this platform to begin to lift the workload off of those investigators that are, that are still uh, up and capable of running. So yes, you can, with a little bit of planning and a little bit of foresight, an organization can use this technology and have it available in a time of crisis and turn it on right when they need it. 
So I'm glad you mentioned kind of the business continuity because as I was doing research on, okay, what have regulators said specifically related to COVID-19 and compliance and AML? And in the same breath, while they talked about kind of compliance, they were also talking about business continuity. Right. Uh, and they were basically saying that, you know, banks, you need to also look at, you know, how to keep operations running in all areas, not just dealing with customers, but dealing with compliance. Are there any things that kind of, you know, um, a, a, a financial institution can do to kind of add some, you know, um, compliance uh, business continuity so that, you know, their kind of AML program when you're hit with, I mean, again, this is like unprecedented since I've been alive, but, you know, when you're hit with some major disaster because there are banks that have been hit with disasters and things like that. So, you know, are there ways that maybe you can either cross train kind of compliance professionals, have some kind of even succession planning or, you know, again, have, you know, some kind of backup plan. Well, if this happens, here's our secondary plan to work from home and here's this point of context. I'm just curious, you know, are there any ways to kind of bolster, you know, fin crime compliance continuity? Yeah, so, you, you know, um, it is certainly being, uh, getting heightened awareness of how we're, we might have to manage in a, in a shortage of, of human capital and a shortage of investigators. So it certainly is top of mind for many of the folks listening to this and their, and their peers uh, out in the industry. And they are doing things like you mentioned, cross training. I know of one organization had had onshore alerts from India and they didn't have the investigators wow. available. And unfortunately they hadn't um, availed themselves yet to that uh, business contingency plan. So they were cross-training administrative staff, the, the wow. one level ones of the investigation. And, you know, I'm sure they all uh, did a great job and they got them trained up and they were running level one of the investigation, but they have their jobs too that they have to worry about. So, you know, while a short-term um, solution to a shortage of human capital might be cross-training and, and keeping people up to speed, it's very, you can see it's very easy for an individual to, if they're not doing that on a regular basis to lose that sort of skill set and go back to their regular job. Oh, good. And, and that's why we created that, that tool that I just sort of walked you through is to enable a technology to, to really fill that gap in the need, in the event of a crisis and, and uh, manage those alerts and not get into regulatory hot water. No, and, and, and you're absolutely right. I, I've, you know, as I've kind of covered, you know, what banks are doing, I've seen some really surprisingly creative ways to try to, you know, deal with the backlog and even kind of push it forward and, and try as much as possible to better manage the overall alert throughput that's coming through your institution. And it, it was like, again, pushing the front line, pushing the knowledge of AML to the front line and fraud, but then even going further, going beyond the front line and even trying to arm customers with knowledge. I've seen different banks create like, you know, fraud resource pages and COVID fraud resource pages. And then, you know, try to share that with customers and email campaigns because they're thinking, look, the only way we can stop, you know, our customers from, you know, falling for these frauds, clicking on those phishing emails is if we help them. And that helps us because that drops kind of, you know, the overall fraud that could be flowing through our institution. So yeah, it's, it's been pretty amazing to me to see how this community of professionals has reacted. Um, pretty inspiring, actually. So there is something I wanted to ask you. You touched on kind of, and you're absolutely right, you know, these backlogs that are happening now. And again, they can't immediately, you know, turn to technology, particularly if they're not already, you know, working with, um, you know, some vendors that have uh, AI systems. But for banks that are kind of falling behind on alerts and cases, either due to layoffs, people are under the weather, you know, do you have any little bits of advice that can kind of help them right now work through that? Uh, yeah, if they're, if they're falling behind, you know, essentially they have uh, three choices. If, if you think about it, if somebody is falling behind, the, the first choice that they have is to just accumulate a backlog, communicate with the regulators, that's the reality yeah, of the world. And honest, right. uh, uh, you know, just let people know what's happening and, and communicate with the regular regulators and their internal stakeholders. That's a choice that they have, and it's a it's it's a perfectly viable choice. You know, as we talked about earlier, they're gonna have to work that off. The second choice is 
the higher consulting organization oh, right. well, yeah, and classic, help them manage party, that. Yeah. Help them manage that backlog. They've there's certainly firms out there that are uh, very good at doing that. They've uh, gained expertise in it. Uh, they know know how what it is that an organization needs to to manage that uh, and work through that backlog. Many look back or something like that, or look back. Uh, many look back or just back. you know keeping them up the pace and and it doesn't have to be offshore to India there's US based firms that do that and, uh, and again like I said they all work great and there's there's of course an expense to that it's a valuable expense they've it's, you know it's it's a valued value added uh, activity and then again the third choice is the is the technology uh, play to this and in the beginning of a transformation in the work effort of what the investigative staff is doing. You know, so we started the, the, the model that I showed you earlier, where people are taking that and putting that on the shelf in the event of a disaster is turning into a conversation, okay, now how do I use this and how do I integrate this and how do I operationalize this into my business, not just in a disaster, but going forward because whether it's a pandemic or whether there's some other natural event that happens or whether there's a, uh, a boom in the economy and a workforce shortage or my budgets aren't high enough to hire the investigators that I need. Is my, whatever the reason for it, organizations are saying, I can take that and operationalize that on, on an ongoing basis. And so oh. that conversation is begin. That is the beginning. Everybody's talked about digital transformation now for how many years? Yeah, this is kind of forcing and, your and, hand. <laughs> and how many people have done any sort of di this is kind of forcing their hand to say, this is the right time to really apply this. We've learned now the pain of, of not transforming our business and digitizing our business as fully as we possibly can. It's time to be able to do that. And here's an easy way to do it. So on the consulting end, what you're saying is, there, is there's no pro bono AML independent consulting firms. They don't just, you know, <laughs> they're really bored. Unless they're their employees want to work for free, I don't think so. <laughs> I've been at IRSCI for 30 years. Ah, I'm bored. I'll help you. No problem. No, that doesn't, that does not. Exist. And they're wonderful organizations with well-trained and, and you know, I, just, I don't, uh, they, they certainly add value to a, a company that needs them. Yes, they do. So, yeah. you know, anytime I chat with you on these things, you always blow me away with kind of the use cases. Um, and I was hoping to share if you have any examples or use cases on kind of how AI has helped AML teams better manage resources, um, you know, kind of uh, versus alerts and improve efficiency and effectiveness. And obviously, I know that, you know, the pandemic is, uh, you know, for some just a few months old. So, you know, this could be either, you know, some historical things that you've um, uh, had happen, or if you have so many examples related to the you know pandemic, I'd love to hear those too. Well, I mean, this is a question: of How much time do you have, Brian? There's so <laughs> many. We've got 17 hours. This is a 24-hour <laughs> David much... Laughlin marathon. No, it's not. Don't worry. No, I have numerous examples of of how we have uh, added efficiencies to to our customers. Are, are a very the most recent one is the implementation, uh, recent implementation of our uh, newest customer. And as part of the, that investigation process that I uh, shared with you earlier, one of the things inside one of those boxes is finding information out about the transacting entities. And one of those things is jurisdiction. You know, where is this transacting party located? And you know, many times those fields especially for counterparties or in correspondent banking is just blank. Right. They don't know it. And so they have to go manually research and try to find and identify where uh, these parties are. We've uh, recently shown with one of our customers, we saved three full days of just that one observable jurisdiction in their uh, research process. And not only did we save three days, at the end of the, the month, because of timing and having to resolve alerts and, and either file them or declare them as false positives, the last week of the month, they didn't even do it. They didn't have time to identify the jurisdiction. And so what happens? It goes in with no jurisdiction. 
it defaults to the most high, the highest risk jurisdiction oh, right, right. and correct. creates a huge amount of false positives from right. it. And so for 25% of the time, they were getting alerts based on jurisdiction that who knows how many of those were in fact not risk, high risk transactions. So huge savings in time and in, in, in the research effort, as well as the false positives that are created from that. And that's one observable out of about 200 that are in that whole investigation process, more than 200 that are in that whole investigation process. So, you know, if I take that, I'll go back to a, a slide again. If I take that and, and show you some results that we have shown about increased effectiveness and efficiency, effectiveness being finding instances of, <clears throat> of risk that uh, current systems can't find, and efficiency being doing that in a very cost-effective manner, you know, with one uh, organization, you know, not a huge organization, about 15 billion in assets, 1,100 employees, 30 of those employees were AML compliance, uh, are AML compliance investigators. Mm -hmm. and, and we showed them, they, they went through a very serial process of implementing our platform. They did pre-TMS work first, looked at the data, filled in things like jurisdiction, line of business, entity type, all the information that is valued by a TMS. Then post TMS, used our alert investigator, that's the automated investigation tool that I showed, as well as the false negative identifier that looks at non-alerted transaction. Dramatic decrease in, in false negatives, hard to put a number on that because they don't know exactly what they're missing. Right. But a dramatic increase in, in uh, uh, instances of risk that they are finding they weren't finding before, about a 70% increase in the automation of the investigation. So in total, over 150% gain in, in efficiency while protecting their organization by finding instances of risk that they weren't finding before. One of the things that you mentioned in December 2018 and the joint regulatory statement and, and the ability to, to try this technology, one of the things the regulator said is we're not going to punish you for things that you find today that you weren't finding previously. Correct. And so this client of ours went all in and said, we're going to use the entire platform and we're going to create efficiencies and we're going to find risks that we may have been missing before and all the benefits of that around right, avoiding potential future regulatory fines and reputations. They've been able to um, garner those benefits. And, you know, that's a really big deal because when I saw that statement and I read through it, you know, it, it literally, David hit the absolute nail on the head. What it said is if the new system you're testing finds more anomalous behavior than uh, your legacy system, as the regulators, we're not going to, again, I'm using the air quotes here, we're not going to yeah. necessarily say right. that your legacy system is bad. Obviously, if like you you know, your new system finds $1 billion in laundered money, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get out of that. Right. But you know, th that's, that's a, a really big deal and a nod, because for a long time, I called it the inertia of good enough. Banks would say, well, I'm not gonna spend money, I'm not gonna change now. My regulator said last year, my program was fine. Why am I gonna change it? Maybe they don't like what I do to change. And the irony of irony is, I'll just share this quick anecdote. I had one of the top minds at one of the biggest banks uh, in the United States tell me, man, Brian, I just, I can't deal with these regulators because, you know, I want to do really cool things with my transaction monitoring system. And anytime I shift away from the road, the rudimentary, it's death by a thousand cuts. Don't nail me on, you know, this risk assessment wasn't updated on the annual basis. What about your low risk population? How do you know they're all still low risk? Things just drive people crazy. And it looks like, you know, both the regulators and the banks are a little bit more on the same page to let's do something different. Let's kind of improve, again, that, uh, that efficiency and that effectiveness really to improve right. results. Right, right. So uh, let's see here. So I had uh, a lot of questions I wanted to go through with you. And, and thank you, by the way, David, for being so gracious with your time. Um, so are there any kind of ways banks can use technology to not just kind of you know, report on financial crime and frauds, but to <clears throat> even better protect customers? or arm them with knowledge so that, you know, their customers are not falling for these scams in the first place? Well, uh, so uh, that presumes that a bank, which many of them do have uh, systems in place to communicate with their customers about what it is that they 
may be seeing or may be finding. And many organizations do that. They will, if you uh, go to their website or you get their communications, they will they will uh, communicate with their customers about uh, things that they are uh, should be aware of as as a customer. Um, you know, the technology. If you're asking to take, how can the technology be used to uh, enable that? I would say, especially in times of crisis like this, we mm -hmm. all know that the criminals increase their behaviors, both uh, the volume of it, and as well as they increase the types of behaviors that they're using. They change their behaviors during crisis to take advantage of them. You know, people doing scams, emailing individuals saying that they have COVID information about them or they have the uh, government check for them. You know, all sorts of types of scams come out in a crisis like this. And so what a, a uh, organization and what our customers can use this technology for is finding new uh, behaviors much faster than before. Again, there's before with the, a, and the, the problem that that uh, senior bank person was bemoaning earlier was a change in a model process. Okay. I, I may, as a, a manager of that organization, know how I want to change it, but I have all the steps that I have to go through. Uh, regulators have to validate, in fact, that that's a behavior. I got to go through a coding exercise to change my model. I got to validate it. You, to, you do QA on it. Then I have to get it implemented, test those results. You know, how long is that process? Two years, maybe? A year and a half, maybe? Yeah, so it's a long, it's, yeah. It's a long, drawn out, painful process for good reason. But it is. And so this technology, again, back to the earlier conversation, the earlier question you had about what is AI and machine learning and how is it different in finding anomalies, it can find anomaly tomorrow. You know, it's been trained to find things that are different. Mm -hmm. And that thing may be a new criminal behavior that they try tomorrow. Right. And with that, with the, it's found that there is a scheme that is being perpetrated by the criminal activity that can be communicated right away. And so during a crisis, you can tell your customers to be wary of being tricked into being a mule. Yeah, exactly. So what we have seen is instances of, during this crisis, instances of criminals taking unsuspecting victims and turning them into mules. And, and before, while that was somewhat limited, not totally, but somewhat limited to the elderly population. Correct. Now yeah. guess who they're targeting? Unemployed, out of work, young folks that are suffering because of the crisis yep. and see an advertisement, oh, I can make money really quickly Cla at well, home. home. scam, yeah. And they have no idea they're being used by a criminal organization until they're too deep in it. So those kind of changes, behaviors, you can find right away, you can communicate, an organization communicate to their customer bases to protect them from uh, being pulled into that. Now, one of the things that gets me also really excited to talk about this is because, you know, one of the most subjective areas of the anti-money laundering program is kind of the decision making, because that's so dependent on your experience, what you've learned, the time you have, the depth of the alert, you know, the, the adequacy of the systems. And again, if you're a top AML compliance officer, you know, you're, yeah, you're making decisions on what has kind of, you know, gotten up to you and filtered up mm -hmm. to you, but how many decisions were made below you from people that are not at your same skill level? And again, whatever decisions they make, even if it seems right at the time or related to their context and information, it's extremely easy for a regulator to always come behind, look at that and say, why did you dispose the alert this way and not this way? This is similar to that. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? And that can happen all through the chain of decision making, you know, uh, and again, who's ultimately responsible, the AML compliance officer. It seems potentially that with kind of, you know, again, I'm, I'm pairing these together, the, the technology and the training. We haven't talked about the training piece, but we will. But if you can kind of have strong technology that's giving you better alerts, it kind of takes some of the pressure off of the decision making because the systems are, are kind of making better decisions for you and maybe presenting to you better alerts that are more kind of, you know, case on a plate, saw on a plate. I don't know what, well, what's your take on that. That's exactly right. Your last statement there is, is, you know, hopefully humans would make the same decision presented with the same All the time. Of course Absolutely. they won't. Of course they won't. But the chances of that happening 
do go up dramatically. You present the same information the same way every single time. A human is generally going to go down the same uh, path. Now, again, that, that can change. And so that's, that's exactly what this technology can do is, is present the, the facts of the case and not be burdened with the overbearing amount of data that can go into that case. Mm -hmm. That's what this technology is very good at. Technology is very good at is looking at massive amounts of data, sorting through and determining which pieces of that data is really important in the context of what's being looked for and presenting that case in a very easy, easily digestible fact case and uh, of a what we call a financial crime report that is that details the entire case who the parties were, what the transactions were, what the jurisdiction, what the adverse media might be tied to, uh, computer generated, auto generated narrative, which, which takes forever for people to write and talk about consistency problems, auto generated narrative that describes the entire case and a recommendation of whether it's a risk or not a risk to the organization. And then a person with their judgment can say, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right with those facts. That is a risk or not a risk. Or, you know what? There's more to this case that I bring to the table and my experience as a human brings to the table to, to be able to read between the lines and see the gray areas and understand the customers and, and understand what's happening in the environment to say, we need to do a little more digging on this thing. Computer got us to the five yard line. Now we got to take this thing into the end zone based on our work. Now, I know we have roughly about 10 minutes left here, but I did want to chat with you, uh, you know, cause, but we also have to separate kind of fact from fiction hype from reality, uh, sure. you know, when it comes to kind of the merging of AI and AML, because there's sure. there's specific pieces of the AML program, and I'm curious what you think of in terms of you know where AI works, uh, you know where it's maybe may, it doesn't work as well to kind of weave that into the AML program, and you have kind of the the four classic prongs and the two kind of more newer prongs. You know, you have your policies and procedures, you have your AML compliance officer. You have your independent audit, um, and uh, I believe it's what the, the transaction. That's AM. What's the fourth one, David? I can't believe this. <laughs> it's a, a, yeah, compliance officer, the audit, um, but also two of the, the new business units. Business, yes, right. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, the training. How could I forget the training? That's the fourth the piece. Training. training. And then the two more recent ones are kind of the risk assessment and then also transaction monitoring. So right. for AI, what areas would you say of these kind of, you know, six areas of AML that AI can work pretty well and, and kind of, you know, hasn't really found a fit yet? Yeah, so um, it can have an impact in the entire process that you described. Um, not a whole takeover of the entire process, but it can have impacts in that entire process because each one of those components, except for the training piece, have data involved. Mm -hmm. And any, anytime you have data involved in it, you have messy, dirty data, and usually voluminous amounts of data. Right. And so all of those sort of components of that, of that process that you described can be used to, um, uh, AI can be used to improve that process. So if I look at, you know, all the way from customer onboarding, all the way back to investigation automation, these are the, uh, in these green boxes, Every single one of these can be improved with the use of this types of these types of technology. Onboarding around, uh, you, you know, is this entity uh, risky? Do we have all the information that we need to to make a decision on onboarding a customer? The enrichment of data after a, a transaction is conducted, and and uh, understanding the true risk segmentation in a dynamic manner about the transacting entities, detecting uh, potential transactions that, that uh, are risky, and then automating that investigation. Again, all of that to provide that final um, decision and adjudication about whether something is risky to an organization. And you know, that takes things like data collection, which is good for technology, unstructured data analysis. You think of adverse media, and the work it takes to find a piece of adverse media and then sort through that article to determine whether 
the transacting, the entity that you're concerned about is the victim, the criminal, the judge, the law enforcement, that unstructured data analysis and, and risk around that is, a, is uh, you know, perfect for uh, computer technologies. Understanding counterparty information that, that an investigator or a bank may, not, my, may have none of, how these parties are connected, and, and also the transaction anomaly. These are sort of components that a technology can use, and it's not limited to these five, but these are sort of examples of it that can go to supporting and enriching these four sort of key processes inside of a, a AML compliance environment. No, and, and you're absolutely, even just like you mentioned the adverse media, negative news, that's a whole like AML subsegment where Absolutely. vendors are selling just the, you know, the <clears throat> negative news piece of this. Watch out for negative news. That's There's right. There's so much news all over the internet. Do you, do you search the internet all the time? Do you craft a bespoke database that's supposedly more filtered? You know, that, that's kind of where that industry is, uh, you know, the, the classic fight for them. That's so, right. So I, I think I had most of the questions I wanted to talk about with you, um, David. Uh, you, know, we, as, you know, like I said, you know, with, with these technologies, um, you can't snap your finger, but, you know, before I ask you about kind of tips there, I mean, you know, it does take weeks or months to kind of, you know, update systems or vendors to update systems, but kind of as this pandemic rolls on now, I mean, again, we, we started talking about this in, you know, December in Wuhan, China, it's now May 13th, you know, uh, do you think some institutions are, are kind of saying, okay, now we're going to, you know, we're going to start making the move to, you know, updating things for the new reality of the pandemic or that they're just kind of you know tinkering and tweaking things here and there with what they can do uh, kind of with their systems right now well I, it's clear that organizations are are rethinking this not all of them but organizations are rethinking about how the work works um, and what it is that um, how they want to build the their operations you know part of that is driven by uh, notification from regulators that you need to do pandemic planning around your workforce. And part of that is driven by the business saying there's an opportunity to dramatically improve how it is that we run this compliance effort within the co confines of a, of a regulatory environment. You, you know, we're in no way recommending people go outside of those confines of a regulatory environment. They need to operate within that and they can use this uh, technology uh, to do exactly that. So yes, people are uh, taking that uh, model that I showed you earlier, the investigator contingency plan, deploying that inside um, in their uh, operation and having that available to them in the event. It's happening. Organizations, uh, maybe some that are listening today, maybe mm -hmm. uh, the peers of fo folks that are listening today are in fact deploying this investigator contingency plan offering. And most of those organizations have the, have the uh, specific intent to then turn that into more than just contingency planning, but turn it into what their ongoing operations uh, look like. And lastly, it's kind of, you know, I know I've talked with you on, on past calls and discussions on this. This is not the, the tech side, but more the kind of compliance process side. But how big a deal or, or how much now is convergence? A piece of this puzzle, you know, where you're getting kind of fraud and AML, maybe even your cyber teams working together. And, and the only reason I ask this is because FinCEN has blown my mind. In some recent years, they've done things related to like um, a business email compromise attacks. And they've, again, I've never seen them do this. They said this uh, missive should go to your AML team, your operational risk team, your fraud team, your cyber team. And, I, you know, that's kind of the foundational mission of ACFCS. And I was like, wow, great. Or, or this is the mission. But um, you know, this is kind of a validation of that convergence philosophy. What's kind of your take on that? You know, is, is that also something that should be in this discussion? No doubt about it. I, the uh, convergence topic is one that I think everybody can look at and admire and say, that's exactly how it should work. Fraud leads to a, a money laundering activity. Absolutely. Bribery leads to money laundering activity. Somebody, a corporation that is worried about the FCPA and the DOJ okay. leads to money laundering. All these things should have convergence. The challenge has been both operational and technical. 
Right. And, and I do believe that this convergence is going from turning from uh, management consultant speak to reality. Mm -hmm. It's not there yet. It's, th it's there in some organizations and not there in, in other Correct. organizations. But I do believe that this is where this world is going to is a convergence of financial crime in a, in a different view of how those different um, use cases interact with each other and, and, uh, and are able to play off each other and take advantage of each other's uh, work. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. I haven't heard one bank that has quote unquote figured it out. In fact, every time I talk to, to kind of talk com, top compliance professionals, I'm hearing a different way and a different structure of convergence. Some are like, okay, we're gonna cross train our teams and we're gonna put them all together in the same room. Then other guys are like, no, we're gonna cross train our teams and we're all gonna have a chat. We all can chat together about these things. And, and some of them, yes, they start to converge and, and cross train the teams, but then they have a super analyst up top that kind of, they know fraud, they know cyber, they know AML. They're basically, they're a unicorn. And they're right. kind of looking down at all the pieces below them to try to catch <laughs> what everyone could miss individually. But no, I haven't heard that, you know, ah, this bank has figured it out. Yeah. Um, so lastly, David, um, you know, I, I was just hoping you could share some kind of tips, uh, tricks, anything that could help, uh, you know, fin crime professionals now dealing with this. I know you, you know, you talk to a lot of clients, a, a lot of banks that are struggling with this. So yeah, any kind of, I'd love to end this with some just nice tips you could have for the profession. And again, thank you for an amazing interview. Very gracious with your time. Of course, no, it's been a pleasure. I think there are three things that um, I would encourage uh, departments and people to to think about and, and deploy and things that can add value to their, their business uh, and their efforts, you know, right away. The, the first thing is, we talked a little bit about it uh, earlier, for investigations, be very aware of mules and, and the, in, you know, the increase of first time users doing online banking mm. is driven, of course, by the crisis. But that's also creating a huge opportunity for criminals to recruit and utilize mules in their online banking efforts and turn their legitimate accounts into essentially pass-through accounts and, and mm -hmm. making bad money look good. And you can do that by using an analysis of values and volumes of transactions. Yes, some values and volumes of transactions are going to be perfectly legitimate. People are going to move, you know, maybe they've sold out of their brokerage accounts and moved a big chunk of cash into their checking account. And maybe that's, you know, they, the bank had never seen somebody do that in the amount that they've seen them do that in the last two months. They've sort of, people have gotten out of maybe the equity markets and that's new. There's also things like people are using credit cards and maybe purchasing from Amazon obviously more than they have in the past. And that would change a, a value and volume a type of a transaction. But those two endpoints, a brokerage account and Amazon or some online reseller are very easy to identify as legitimate transactions. And you see values and volumes of a customer, of a retail customer change, but the endpoint of that is something very different, i.e. a shell company mm -hmm. or a LLC in the Cayman Islands. Uh, you probably have a mule now running that account. Foreign high risk regions, right? It, you know, even if it's in, even if it's not necessarily even foreign, if the entity that they are transacting with, if they've had a big jump in the values of transactions and the volumes of transactions, and the other party is not looking legitimate, that V and V trigger can be a trigger to show you that you have a mule running an account. So I would, I would look for that specifically. Nice. That's one thing. Another tip is on the regulators and, and uh, what's happened with uh, regulator statements since the crisis. You know, the FFIC put out their guidance a uh, little bit more than a month ago now, I think, uh, specifically the pandemic. I would pick that up. I would encourage everybody to pick that up and read it if they haven't. Even if, even if you're never going to meet a regulator doing a, an audit, it's good to know what they are thinking specifically about pandemics, they talk of two things. Organizations need to be prepared for the scale and the scope of a pandemic, as well as the length. These are different disasters than a server block catching on right, fire right. or a building going down or a hurricane. This, this might last years potentially. Oh, potentially, wow. let's hope not. 
Let's hope not. But <laughs> I got to get out of the they, house. Let's hope not. <laughs> they, they specifically address the scale. Say the organizations have to address the scale and the length of this, and they have to address an unavailable staff. Mm -hmm. And I would bet nine out of 10 folks listening to this, their business contingency plans don't address those two issues around. So I, I, would, just, I would pick that up and read it and ask yourselves whether you're, you're ready for somebody coming in and ask you about that. And then a uh, third tip is technology and, and um, just how you can best use technology to increase resilience. That's you know, certainly the new, uh, the word that uh, many people are talking about is resilience of organizations. And many organizations have been, have, been, have shown their resilience in, in taking workforces off site and you know relatively quickly have gotten them into a very productive environment by taking them off site but there is resiliency beyond just taking a hundred percent of your staff and taking them off site you have to think through resiliency of entire workforces and and what happens if 10 20 30 percent of that workforce is unavailable so i would look to your technology to to determine whether and to think through how you can use technology to make your organization more resilient. Excellent. Well, uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a virtual round of applause here. Uh, <laughs> this was an awesome interview, David. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of talk about this. And, and really, like I said, you, you know, you're in my mind a bit of the solution here to that gap in terms of the 314C. Uh, you've shared some incredible tips, tactics, advice here that maybe you know, some small and medium banks definitely didn't heard of, and, and even some of the brightest minds at large institutions, you know, they're gonna find value in, in this discussion uh, and this knowledge as well. So everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for listening. And feel free to, if you wanna know more about David, wanna know more about Quantiverse, uh, feel free to reach out to him. Um, he's well, well, an approachable, warm professional um, that you know, I've learned every time I've chatted with him. And if you want to know about us, Association of Certified Financial Crime Specialists, go to acfcs.org. Until next time. Brian, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely enjoyed it. Thanks, David. Bye.